Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 14. <laughs> it's letting me know that it's time to start. <laughs> welcome to episode 14 of On Air. Today, we have Mark Adams joining us for Expeditions, Data and Myth, Measurement and Poetry. But before I introduce Mark, I want to give our community shout out, which today, I think, you know, fits very well. The flower fields of Carlsbad, they're located in North uh, San Diego County. And they have developed a virtual way of welcoming guests to, the, to roam their 50 acres of spectacular renuncles, flowers, and other floral exhibits while enjoying it from the comfort of your own home. Right now, until uh, Mother's Day, viewers can go behind the scenes and look at, um, look at how this working flower range works with video tours of the flower fields on, social, on their social media channels. Viewers will be able to interact with teams while they share live updates from the fields on Instagram and Facebook. So this Mother's Day, you can take your mother on a virtual tour of the flower fields. Now I would like to introduce Mark Adams. He is a curator, painter, printmaker, and cartographer from the National Park Services. He's based out of Cape Cod and Marth Martha's Vineyard, and he co-curated Conan Selesnik's upcoming exhibition at the Providence Ta Provincetown uh, Art Association and Museum, along with Mara Coughlin, who we've met before, and we've met Mark before as well during our uh, curatorial panel discussion. Mark received his BA in Biology and uh, Ecology from UC Berkeley, and his MLA uh, in Environmental Planning also from uh, UC Berkeley. He has taught at the Provincetown Art Association, at Castle Hill Center for the Arts, and the Provincetown School Academy program. He has worked as a wildlife biologist, scientist, illustrator, forest firefighter, and a gymnastics coach. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for, for inviting me. I'm really glad to be here. Um, yeah, um, well, I'm, uh, I'm actually, um, it's a privilege to be able to uh, talk about uh, Nicholas and Richard's work and also to weave it in with uh, my own work as a scientist and an artist. And um, uh, let's see, I wanna start the first slide here, see how this works. Now, if I start, wait, let's see, how do I do the uh, screen share? Do I, sorry, <laughs> where's the screen share? the green button on the oh, bottom. Okay, there yeah. we go. <laughs> and, um, and then I'll do this. And how's that? How does that look? That's perfect. Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, knowing these guys for really since the early 90s and seeing their work, it always resonated with me. Um, in terms of the experience of being an artist and also the kind of peak um, inspiration that we get from nature and, also, and as well as the hazards and worries of seeing nature's decline and seeing our own perilous state within nature. Um, you know, in their work, there's, there's humor, uh, there's um, detail, there's incredible imagination. But there's also this sense of foreboding about nature. But um, anyway, I, um, I often saw images that they developed and thought, these are so close to experiences I've had that are not art experiences at all, they're science experiences. And I also, as, I'll t as I give my talk, I would like to challenge the listeners to um, think about their own experiences, both in nature and art, you know, be they collectors, observers, bird watchers, or, or not, and think about how these uh, images could inspire them to kind of um, uh, use their, their experience in nature to, um, to, to, to both become observers through the techniques of science and art. So um, with that, I'll talk about, you know, here's a, my montage of some of the science experiences that I've had. And I really want to highlight partly the how they resonate, but also that um, getting in nature and using some kind of systematic method of observation is really makes things rich. And these are some of the most memorable experiences that I've had. And I'm going to talk about a few of them. 
uh, some of these, the inspirations in nature sometimes are mysteries that we translate, even if we don't understand them, we translate them into images. Um, the upper left is a, an otter slide in the snow near my house, um, which brought up all kinds of vivid pictures of how otters live. I didn't even know they were nearby. And the image in the bottom left is um, one of my childhood, you know, Time Life magazine images that inspired me to want to see uh, what nature does. And I know that Nicholas and Richard um, both grew up with uh, an experience of nature that um, gave them something to say in their work. Um, and uh, the other thing is that uh, their work tells a story just the way that scientists try to tell a story by compiling many, many observations, by turning them into a system that sort of explains a question about the world. Um, you know, that's, the, that's why things like Treasure Island ring because, you know, here on the title page of Treasure Island is a map and it uses all of the language of science and cartography to illuminate this fantasy story that you can go into. And, you know, most people romanticize maps and they um, see maps as this um, mysterious language, but also a vocabulary that doesn't need words. Um, the thing that we do both as scientists and artists is we collect things. And sometimes it's sort of random. Uh, we just collect things that catch our eye, not knowing what they mean as we go along. And some of the, the work that um, Khan and Selesnik have done are just full, they're just overflowing with collections, collections of things. And sometimes the way they organize them kind of confounds you and gives you a, a kind of a, um, a challenge to say what, how do these things relate to each other? Well, we do the same thing, you know, we all know what a mushroom is, um, but you really need to go through and collect them and taste them and uh, to understand them. And, um, but this is a really a basic um, practice of science and art as well as cuisine. <laughs> to collect things in nature. Here's a stone I collected when I was a kid. It's a fossilized coral, a Petoskey stone that's found in Northern Michigan when there was a saltwater ocean there. And it's something that I just held through my life as a, a, an icon of a place. Um, you know, we're all have, if you're like me, you have shelves full of things that you collected and some of them mean something in terms of a story to you and some of them have a scientific meaning. Um, the other thing is we're attracted to uh, the exotic and sometimes when you look closely enough, the ordinary thing can be very exotic. Um, and this is something really uh, striking that um, Kahn and Selesnik do in their work is take, you know, elements of something ordinary <clears throat> and turn it into an exotic vision. Now, Mark, this reminds me of something that you said before um, about the collections, that collections don't have meaning until you give them a story. And I thought that was such a powerful idea, right? That we all collect things that are in some ways maybe meaningless until we tell the stories around these collections. And, you know, that's, that's right. what that's science right. does. You know, and that's what artists do. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and you know, I'll show you another slide uh, in a second here. There's a few, you know, this is a very or ordinary snake that um, these rig neck snakes come into my office um, every spring. I see them like crawling under my chair. They come under the walls. They're just an ordinary thing. But when you see them, it looks like jewelry. It looks like something strange. And then walking on the beach, you see these sunfish, which have this outlandish body that, you know, you can't imagine how nature thought that up. Uh, these are squid that are printed with their own ink. So there's a kind of expression of that exotic animal in the, in a, that's actually quite ordinary. But you're, what you're talking about is this idea of taxonomy. And this is a kind of a inscrutable diagram that Connor Lesnick made uh, about the relationship between things. And um, so when we start to put these things together, things that we found in the same place that might have a relationship, um, I spent four years in a lab drawing fish eggs for a science study of San Francisco Bay. Um, and and then with the help of other scientists piecing together these life histories of, uh, of fish, of ordinary fish, but how they looked when they were just hatched a couple of millimeters long. And this is taxonomy. This is, you know, the org organization, organizing 
these collected objects in terms of their relationships to each other, uh, species within a species and then across species and how they're similar. This is how we understand the world through this organization. And we need art, we need illustration and art to extract those useful, meaningful marks of these creatures. Um, and so then uh, there's another way that we go, that scientists go and look at the world in a more organized fashion instead of just random collecting. And sometimes they use exotic instruments like the, when you're sampling fish in the creeks of the mountains, use a, a shocking instrument that stuns the fish so you can pick them up and measure them and let them go again and they recover. Um, a lot of Conan Selesnik's work um, expresses this idea of going into the field and, uh, um, and using what, you know, these tools that they've gathered symbolically um, to uh, uh, understand <clears throat> in a systematic way what's going on. This is a place in North California called the Geysers, a geothermal valley. It's actually quite remote, even though it's near San Francisco. And I worked there collecting, doing studies to um, trap and mark animals. We, um, I, most of my work was collecting lizards with a slip noose and marking them and recapturing them. So we got an idea of uh, how many there were. And the, the reason why we were interested in lizards because they're actually one of the most common organisms in this California habitat. Um, so, and then of course I had this amazing experience where I'd been looking at the ground all day collecting lizards and I looked up and there was this pygmy owl devouring a lizard above me. And uh, I spent an hour watching him and he just stared back at me as he did this. And these are like, you know, things that are right there in front of us that we don't see. So a lot of their work also expresses this idea of um, how do we track ourselves in nature? And um, <clears throat> people I work with have implanted radio trackers into some rare snakes and then gone out and uh, tried to describe their home ranges uh, and um, where their refuges are and where they breed. And, um, you know, these animals, again, uh, that live in the sand underground and really quite common, but we just don't see them. And we understand so little about nature, uh, in fact, even though you think that these things are ordinary. There's another hog nose. Uh, um, and the same with, you know, the, all of these other seemingly exotic animals that we mark and recapture. Um, this is a, a, a bird bander looking at the bird bands on a chain and he's using those as a memory device to remember uh, the birds that he's seeing. Um, the other thing that, that I've done a lot of in my science work is uh, surveying, surveying and doing hydrology, uh, the physical sciences. Um, and uh, that allows me to get offshore and see the cliffs, see the glacial uh, remains of, of the glaciers and do sightings and measure elevations and bathymetry, the depth of the ocean. Uh, so these are some of the tools we use for precision GPS. And again, you know, there's a picture um, in I think one of Celestin King Khan's uh, signature pictures has uh, Richard on a little one wheel device <laughs> that looks a lot like this. Um, but, um, you know, in science, we go back through history for to stand on the shoulders, as Newton said, of giants. And this is a surveyor from the 1890s who came to Cape Cod and we um, used his measurements so that we get a century scale picture of how the shape of the land has changed. Um, again, this is some of the exotic and ordinary uh, science stills from these various attempts to go out and, you know, and this, this experience, this kind of Indiana Jones experience of going into nature, no matter what technology you have, it's still you against nature. It's still, you know, you might not be able to land a boat. You might not be able to uh, walk where you need to walk through the dense forest. Um, uh, we are still puny humans in nature, but all this measurement is um, is kind of noble work, and I think uh, Slezik and Khan also ennoble it with how, the way they've uh, presented their various troop theater mouse uh, adventures and um, and outcasts. <laughs> this is a, an expedition we did to the Sea Islands off the coast of Maine to look at where uh, seabirds nest and see how they'd be affected by sea level rise. So we need these very precise instruments developed basically for defense department and missile purposes, but now we use them to measure elevations and sea level rise. And along the way, a few sketches help set the scene. And sometimes this whole GPS idea 
uh, gives you an idea of um, how your reference points are, are actually, can be remapped by artists in a way that relates more closely to you. Why should the constellations be the property of the Greek gods? Why not use our ordinary objects to, um, to map the skies? Um, and as I mentioned before, there's this idea of you go out alone, you um, face the hazard and risks of being in the field uh, to get this information. And you know, the, all the basic skills of handling a boat, of uh, understanding the tides and the weather, um, handling animals is dangerous um, to a certain extent. And sometimes you're down, out at the end of a remote peninsula and need to have really good planning to get back. Um, so the, again, these are some of my colleagues in the field doing measurements. Another project that is echoed by Khan and, and Selesnik's work is um, geology studies that we've done of uh, tectonic plates. And again, you know, you get the sense of these remote landscapes and the vastness of the world. Here's an early picture from 130 million years ago of, of North America and Africa as close neighbors. And we went to North Africa um, to do GPS of, and this is also Greece. So um, along with some friends at MIT, we were surveying mountaintops to see each year how many inches those continental plates had moved um, and how the earth is reshaping itself um, due to um, plate movement and uh, the closing of the Mediterranean, which is happening on this other time scale entirely. Another thing that art, artists try to do is give us a sense of scale in time and scale in space. Um, and science has a language for that. This is our order of mission that from the Moroccan government that allowed us to roam, kind of reminiscent of a lot of the exotic stamps and documents that Khan and Selesnik have created in their, in their work that give you the sense of uh, adventure, mission, um, strange languages, other cultures. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a, I love the way their work gives us an awareness of uh, what it's like to be an adventurer in the world. This is our GPS unit in uh, the Atlas Mountains in Morocco, in a place where we had to guard it from being knocked over by donkeys and goats. Um, and in the meantime, we had to make friends with the locals and let them know what, what we were doing there so they, they would help us, at least not interfere. So, you know, one of us would sit by the GPS while the other went into town to drink tea in a cafe and say hello to people. Um, and here's a, a kind of a, one of the um, Khan and Selesnik's works that, that echoes that experience. This is part of their Mars series. Um, and again, just some vignettes of what it's like to do science in a remote place. And, you know, with the elements, the, um, the heat of the sun, the remoteness, uh, and the simple pleasures of having a tin pot that you can boil on a, on a gas burner and have coffee or tea. Uh, near an oasis. Um, children that came up and talked to us, we didn't um, share language, but we shared cookies. Um, and they were really interested in what we we're doing. And who knows, um, maybe someday they'll discover geology. And just the way artists um, can portray an image and inspire people to go out and uh, investigate. Um, and one more thing about uh, the use of the physical sciences and the, and the cosmos uh, that relates back to human um, history, human feeling, human um, society and heritage is these, some of these domes are, are for observation of the skies. They all are actually, but one is, it was uh, paid for by the Saudi government to understand exactly the time of moonrise for the beginning of Ramadan. So astronomy is very important in culture. Uh, so another um, example that rings with me from their work is this idea of visualization, of taking, how do you um, visualize the landscape in a way that allows you to understand it better. And one thing we did with collaborating with other artists is gave them GPS units and had them draw on the landscape by walking, by walking around the land. And here's a big, this goose has a wingspan of about half a mile on the beach, uh, just done by walking intuitively. Uh, with the GPS unit. 
um, other kinds of simulation in the Southern Sierra I had to do drawings of how uh, a hydroelectric project would change the landscape. Um, and um, in this example, you can see this really feels like a big, gigantic, colossal environmental art project. In the, in the upper left, there's the power line corridor, the mode corridor of, of the power lines through the foothills of the mountains. And what we had to do for this project was simulate a new power line corridor in the Southern Sierra by flying weather balloons along the positions of these towers. So we flew in by helicopter, some of us hiked, some of us went by boat. And we flew them all simultaneously just for a day so that the big shots could fly over and see the course of this corridor. Um, you know, it's a way of understanding a landscape that is otherwise invisible to us. And again, something that uh, artists do very well, someone like Christo, um, and so another um, way of understanding the landscape is to see it burn. <laughs> and this is a, uh, as in California, you know this very well. Um, I worked as a firefighter in uh, the Los Padres National Forest in California years ago for one, a very big fire. And then we've also used fire as a landscape manipulation to reduce fuels, to uh, uh, modify the landscape, to make it safer. But again, you, there's a peak experience here of um, being out at night in, a, in, a, in an ash covered forest looking for stumps that are still burning and, and feeling like you're at the end of the world. So a couple more examples of um, science in the area of emergency response. Um, this is the oil spill in the Gulf that happened um, something like 10 years ago, which is kind of this constant tragic spilling of oil through the Gulf, and that was that's the uh, New Orleans spit, uh, the mouth of the Mississippi. And uh, through that time, I was able to collect sketches and measurements, little notes that I had to transmit by radio. Uh, we went out to all the Gulf Islands off the coast of Mississippi and walked um, every inch of the island looking for oil spill uh, that could be cleaned up. And uh, again, you know, it's amazing how you feel uh, at the end of the earth, even though you're only, um, you know, a few miles offshore. Uh, but another thing that impressed me is artists like Conan Sleznik would probably um, jump at the chance to be able to operate in the landscape at this scale, to be able to move about with big equipment over vast landscapes, to deploy uh, helpers and, and apprentices. Um, and I made some of these montages of my sketchbooks and weather maps and observations. One of the other ironies that's expressed well in their work is what's left uh, at, at the point of an apocalypse, what's left? And um, this was kind of came home to me when we'd be offshore on these islands and we came back and um, and we had to stop in the casinos just to get coffee because nothing else was open. And there were these robot blackjack dealers just constantly giving that smile and that come on and being, in a, you know, robots, um, you know, kind of when all the humans are gone, the robots might just keep talking to us. <laughs> um, and this is the, this is Hurricane Sandy, uh, which uh, um, hit the East Coast uh, a while back and we went out to map the, all of these abandoned boats and uh, things that are out of place because of the hurricane. Um, and we got to see behind the scenes of a lot of these uh, backdrops of Americana, like this running around in the Statue of Liberty um, with no one there and there's piles of debris all around it before it was restored again. And it has the same feeling as, well, this is from the Mars project of Khan and Sleznik and, uh, um, that sort of melancholy adventure of going off um, when there's so little left <laughs> of, of the familiar world. And so and an, another thing that's really intriguing about their work is their use of maps and the use of geography and coordinates. So this is part of the, the iceberg project, which is one of the most vivid for me of their um, installations of this errant iceberg that traveled through, um, the, through Scandinavia and inspired um, events, you know, in the communities, the coastal communities had festivals and then the icebergs went away. 
but using maps here's a this is a always been an inspiring map to me this is the um the stick charts of south pacific that were are used to teach navigation uh this is a, a civilization that that traveled by canoe and inhabited islands between hawaii and and the South Pacific, um, and they understood the currents and the waves and the, the atolls as little cowrie shells uh, in a way that isn't, it's kind of a non-Western indigenous knowledge, which again, something that maybe only artists uh, may know how to represent. You know, I use traditional maps in my work. We navigate, um, this is uh, Champlain's early maps of New England from 1604 are some of the first maps and they're loaded with information but in a language that was relevant to their time of monsters and winds um, and in order to make a map you know a, a science map we extract information we throw everything away but a few diagrams a few uh, lines and colors and this map language which um, again artists like Selesnik and Kahn developed these languages in their work this is the Gulf of Maine. It's a little shelf uh, off of New England that has a certain kind of um, its own little system of circulation. And I did drawings of that for both science purposes and, and turned it into a big floor map to play with scale, to, to give people the feeling of entering in to the map. And this is something that uh, Selesnik and Khan do uh, with their installations, with their room scaled collections is, uh, play with the scale and the immersion of the feeling. So finally, um, I just want to talk about another thread through their work, which is uh, the idea of that at some point we might all be nomads. And um, I become very conscious of the refugee situation, both at the um, southern border of the US and in the Mediterranean. I've done a lot of uh, volunteer work in the Mediterranean in uh, some of the refugee camps in the Greek islands. And this is a refugee boat that holds 60 people and really is not very seaworthy. And these people are still, even this time of the virus, they're still uh, looking for a better life, escaping war, escaping disruption. And there's a sense that environmental disruption is only going to add to this flow, this human flow. The, um, the migration of people to find better lives and to be secure in the world. Um, so Life Jacket Graveyard in Lesbos, the island of Lesbos, this is not an art piece. This is a collection of all the life jackets as for the people. Happily, these are people who landed, who made it at least as far as uh, the European border and uh, dropped their life jackets. And the collection is something that amounts to a big statement. And uh, again, uh, works like some of their, their works uh, express this idea of, of being, of venturing out with whatever you can carry, being prepared or unprepared into this world that's um, a bit unforgiving, a bit uncertain, um, but something that maybe we all might have to face at some stage as the climate changes and as uh, our systems fail us. So, th so that's the end of my slides. Uh, I'll just throw this parting shot of uh, the ocean in Cape Cod uh, and that feeling every time you look out, there's a sense of being on the edge of something. And I, I thank um, Nicholas and Richard for their very vivid um, portrayals of these ideas. And thanks for letting me talk. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. I um, didn't want to interrupt with my questions because I thought uh, it was going so well as a beautiful narrative that you put together. And I loved how uh, the pictures that you selected and Khan and Selesnik's work, so representing both your work and their work, float so nearly into each other. So I think it really exemplified the, the scientific exploration and the arc exploration that goes into both sides of the story. I think it's really incredible. Thank you for sharing. Um, I thought the part where you were talking about how you use GPS to map human tra the human movement and it ended up being these shapes. Uh, very, and then in relation to uh, the last voice on earth being the robot. I thought those were really interesting uh, 
also to like tie together this idea of we have computers mapping our movement, but at the end, it's going to be their voices that are representing our movement. It's not no longer our voice. And I thought it was really fascinating. Well, hopefully um, we will rise to the occasion. And, um, uh, you know, I don't have that dark of you, uh, although I think the the future that faces is so challenging. But, um, but I think, you know, hopefully one of the points that comes through here is, is being scientists and artists and doing all those steps, observing the world, collecting and organizing your observations. And it should lead to us being better humans, better animals, better able to live in the world. Yeah, and that's the point of storytelling, right? The, we learn, we can adapt, we can change because of storytelling. And like you were saying, we collect things, but ultimately they become meaningful when we start telling the stories. And that's what ultimately leads to change. Um, we have a couple of questions that I would like to ask uh, you as well. And I encourage everybody else to leave your questions in here in our Q&A section as well uh, for Mark. The first question it said, uh, you said you use tools developed by the Defense Department. Do you ever think about their original use when you're working in nature? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, there's so many ironies in that because, uh, you know, those very sophisticated GPS units, um, the one I was using on the beach costs about $60,000. And so in our small budget as a conservation agency, you know, that's huge. That's monumental to be able to to have that instrument. But they're designed to be put on the end of a missile and blown up. They're designed to guide the missile and then be part of the destruction. Um, and so think about that, <laughs> think about that for a minute. Um, you know, we've benefited a lot from technology, but isn't it strange that, um, that we can uh, garner millions of dollars um, for defense and so little for conservation, even when it's related to our own survival. Yeah, well, I think uh, there's a lot of complicated issues around all of those conversations, right? A lot of uh, the science that we now know so well, especially when it comes to human behavior, was not gained in very ethical ways, to say the least. So I think, you know, that those conversations are you know, persistent throughout our lives. Uh, the next question, I've always wanted to ask this question. If there were an end of the world and you survived somehow, where would you probably be? What would be most, what would be the most habitable place? Um, wow, okay. Um, let's see. Well, okay. I don't, I don't know if I have an answer to that in the extreme way it's phrased. Um, you know, it depends on the, the, the way the world ends. Um, but um, I actually, you know, right now, when you think of the hazards that are part of our lives, we just have to understand them. So, you know, in California, you have fires and earthquakes. Here we have hurricanes and storms. There's sea level rise. And often keep, people come to me and say, well, I have a house by the cliff. Should, you know, or sh should I buy this house by the cliff? And I usually tell them, we've measured the, how those cliffs are changing. We actually can predict over the long term what the erosion rate of those cliffs is. So go out and just step it off. How many footsteps to the edge of the cliff? In this case here, it's about three feet per year of our glacial cliffs retreating. And so if, if you want to do a 30-year mortgage and enjoy your house on the cliff, then measure it and know the risks and know what you're bargaining for uh, and then be willing to give it up. But um, gosh, uh, when I think of all the ways the world can end, um, <laughs> I, I guess one other thought is that, you know, right now I feel extremely lucky to be sequestered and quarantined here in a place where I'm surrounded by trails, where there's the beaches nearby, there's trails, and my, my um, uh, what do you call it? My quarantine is about several square miles. And so if I was the only one left, if I had that space to wander, you know, just the way Thoreau could be alone in, in a cabin, 
um, I feel like that's uh, something that humans can find fulfillment with to be in nature. Definitely. Speaking of which, uh, I'm curious to know more about how the National Park Services and how yourself and science and, you know, field work um, is changing with coronavirus or COVID-19. Well, in our case, um, you know, they're taking a very cautious approach and trying to, uh, you know, I work for Cape Cod National Seashore and we have several t towns nearby. We're in the state of Massachusetts trying to do everything in partnership with the state and the local towns. Um, but one of the tricky things is, you know, they're really looking out for the safety of employees as well. Normally every summer we hire dozens of lifeguards, dozens of, uh, of seasonal rangers and educators, um, but we can't put them in a dormitory because they have to be able to be quarantined if there's an outbreak. So we may have to operate without all those great people. Um, and it may, it may mean, you know, the distancing that people talk about. I don't know, I, you know, in our situation, it's just so important for people to take their own responsibility. And um, we were just talking about this this morning. Whether you agree with uh, the specifics of wearing masks and distancing, it's essential that we consider others, that we just act respectfully for others, no matter what you believe yourself and not make other people uncomfortable. As far as nature, you know, this is actually a great time for nature in a way because there's the air pollution is going to be so much less. One of the things we're keeping up um, uh, religiously is uh, our measurements of air quality because with fewer planes flying, um, we think there's going to be dramatic change in air quality. Um, but yeah, everybody's you know, carbon it, footprint is so much smaller. Oh. Hopefully, <laughs> but but you know the other thing is that um, this is a data point, a single data point. In nature is a long game. Humans, you know, we might sacrifice something important to our lives, but in nature, there's a long game, and hopefully, um, nature will have an outcome of its own in a different time scale than our own. Yes. <laughs> no, um, Mark, I want to thank you so much. I think, um, you know, it was really fascinating to learn more about, you know, field work and what all goes into that. And really, I always really enjoyed the connection between art and science. And I think it's really strong, but we don't always recognize it. And I think, you know, your talk has been really enlightening when it comes to that relationship and how important it is to visualize science and for uh, science to push art further and, you know, both of those. So, yeah, thank you so much for your talk thank you. and My joining pleasure. us today. Yeah. My pleasure. And everybody hear, else. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I just, um, some of those ideas I'd love to hear back. People should uh, um, check in and say how their observations are going in nature and um, uh, what they're seeing this time. Yeah. Um, if you tag logs and if you post anything on social media, you can uh, tag logs and we can share that with Mark as well. So thank you so much, Great. everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Ciao. <laughs>